Amen and amen. Looks like the loaves and fishes out there. You've multiplied since first service. So glad to have everyone here today. And I um, <clears throat> am switching gears now from the first message. Uh, pastor called me this week and said he felt like that the Lord told him I should had a word for this morning. When he called me, I had to trust him because I didn't have one. <laughs> so I have great trust in our pastor. And, uh, but sure enough, as soon as I started digging in there, I could see that the Lord perhaps was. The good part about me standing here is you'll have to be the judge if our pastor was correct or not. <laughs> Amen. Uh, the title of this series, and we don't just give these titles to a series. We believe they're inspired by the Holy Spirit and uh, for a purpose and for a reason. Uh, this morning I spoke on a, a different topic, uh, on a, a, a prophetic view of our times. Uh, as in the days of Noah, I covered some information this morning that causes us to look at it to give us a sober view, I guess you could say, of a world that we're in and where we are. Uh, and if you go by my teaching this morning, if that was all there was to it, it would be pretty depressing. But, take heart. Amen. Take heart. Now this is a true message for today's church. And um, I'm gonna make an unusual request. Jason, could I have a cup of coffee? Just a good, just a little cup of coffee. I know he's got a maker up there, so I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna turn loose your cover here. But I need a little coffee if I could. Um, in this message this morning of take heart, there is a. I, that's in the scripture which we're going to look at, but take heart is a mystical term. It's not words. On the first layer, it's words of encouragement. But it goes deeper than that. How do I know that? Because it's in God's Word. And so we're going to start off on the surface, take heart. But I'm wanting to take us uh, a little deeper, if you will, a little broader. I don't ever what you want to term it, but I want us to look at the, the word mystical there is not a bad term, okay? It's more of a spiritual, uh, the truth, the spiritual truths uh, frame the natural world. And uh, so if we want to change the natural world, it's because we look at the truths that are in God's Word. And so as we look at this uh, this term here, take heart, those are actually scriptural words and terms. Uh, but if you look at that picture, the reason that one was chosen, you see the, the girl sitting there on the ground and you see her shadow on the wall. Then right beside her, you see a book, which is the Bible. And then it's casting a shadow, you know, which is Jesus Christ. Now that is, uh, in prophetic terms, that is... Uh, very uh, revelatory, it's real, and it's true. I love the way that that one depicts the Bible and then the shadow of that is Christ. And uh, here comes my cup of coffee. Thank you, Jason. I know Heather probably fixed it, but thank you just the same. <laughs> very kind. Uh, and... Uh, but as we see that shadow, the Word of God, and then the shadow, it's the shadows of the Word of God that I want to speak on perhaps this morning. And as we see that uh, shadow, it's got the, its hand, Christ's hand, 
is on the is on the shadow of the girl. I think I asked last week how many could identify with that girl uh, there, and uh, in dis- perhaps some kind of despair. Uh, and it looks as though she's had the word of God there beside her. And as we look in to this topic of take heart, that's the message of that book and that shadow of Christ. When he puts his hand on her, he's saying, take heart. Now, I want to just go with me here. How in the world could Christ put his hand on something and something not be transferred? That, how could it not? I just don't think I could develop a, an argument that would defend why if he touched you that nothing would be transferred. I just don't think it could happen. So what I like about this picture here is got Christ, got his hand on her, says to take heart. Christ puts his... Every time we take up the word of God, it is equal unto Christ putting his hand on your shoulder. That's how important it is. You can say, well, Alan, I've, I've not ever experienced that. D- just do it a little more. I dare you. Because the Word of God is a supernatural book. I do not believe we had exhausted its supernaturalness. It's just, it's just because I haven't experienced it doesn't mean it's not there. But I am compelled that it's there. And so, as we move forward in this understanding of take heart, take heart, and I'm going to show you some scripture, is the scripture, is the word of God, it's the scripture, it's Jesus doing a transference. All right, are you with me? All right, let's go. What does take heart in the Bible mean? Let's look at this. This is what it means. To take heart is to take control of your mind so that you can be brave and courageous and face difficult times. That's what that term, take heart. Some translations, it says be courageous. And so therefore, you can see in this definition, it has the word courageous included in it. But to take heart is to take control of your mind so that you can be brave and courageous and face difficult times. You say, well, Alan, I just can't take control of of my mind. Okay, that's lie number one. Okay, That, that is lie number one. Now, you're maybe not used to it, but you can, or this book is lying. Yes, you can. Now, now let's, let's watch you. Go with me here. I'm going to give you a little scripture here. Uh, Jesus says this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. You see that? But he says, take heart. I have overcome the world. Well, you should have got gooched there just a little. And Jesus should have gooched you just a little bit. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. The, in this world you will have trouble. Can somebody say amen? amen? Okay. But take heart. Now I need a bigger amen. 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 But take heart. I have overcome the world. Amen. Amen. So when Jesus has touched her, He said, take heart. He is now saying, I have overcome the world. Now she'll overcome the world because Jesus touched her. That's That's right. All right, go with me a little further. Now, here's what I put up here. I'm going to remind you this two or three times. To take heart is to take control of your mind so that you can be brave and courageous and face difficult times. Has anybody got difficult times? I've got a few extra if you need any. 
I'll be glad to share. All right, now let's, let's, let's watch it. Take heart. Another scripture. Be strong and take heart and have what? No fear of them. For it is the Lord your God who is going with you. He will not take away his help from you. So Jesus has got his hand on your shoulder. He says, be strong and take heart. Okay, there's an impartation happening here when he says to take heart. That impartation is, and have no fear. So when I take heart, there's an impartation of no fear but peace. Now you say, well, Alan, I've tried. No, listen to me. When you encounter Jesus touching you, then and only then can you take heart, the heart the Bible's speaking about. Now there again, we're going a little deeper. It's not just a word of encouragement. Now watch this. For it is the Lord your God who is going with you. He will not take away his help from you. So whatever crisis you're in, Jesus puts his hand on your shoulder and says, take heart and have no fear. I'm going with you. Good. I don't want to go by myself. <laughs> I'm scared of the dark, if you will. I want him to go with me. Now, that's just not a good word. That is an impartation. You got to catch that. It's an impartation to have Jesus lay his hands upon you and say, take heart and have no fear for it is the Lord your God who is going with you. He will not take away his help from you. Now, you can read that or you can read that and experience that. There's a difference to just read it and to experience that. The impartation is the experiencing of that. Good. Now let's go here a little further. Once again, to take heart is to take control of your mind so that you can be brave and courageous in the face of difficult times. Take control of your mind. Take heart. Take control of your mind. Take heart. Take control of your mind. Take heart. Could taking heart be a choice? Could it, be, could it truly begin with a choice? But I'm in a crisis. When I'm in a crisis, I usually lose my mind. Anybody else? <laughs> right. But he says, take heart. And we got a choice to make. I'm going to show it to you. But Jesus, turning and seeing her, said, daughter... Take heart. Your faith has done what? Made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. But Jesus, turning and seeing her, said, Daughter, take heart. Jesus touched her and said, Daughter, take heart. This morning... Jesus is in the room and he's wanting to touch some of you and say, take heart. I'm telling you the truth. Steve said, Pastor Steve said, Alan, the Lord says you got a message for us today. And also said I needed to hear it. You, yeah, yeah, you did. I, yeah, you did. He said, I also said I needed to hear it. He needed to hear it before I got it. This is, this is good. So your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that very hour. How could Jesus put his hand on me and it not increase my faith? It, it's just impossible. What I'm hoping you're getting a little bit is we need a touch from Jesus. So we can take heart. We're losing our heart. 
because the enemy is robbing us of our Jesus. Now, just what, go with me here just a moment. There again. Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Here's my definition again. To take heart is to take control of your mind so that you can be brave and courageous and face difficult times. You know, we pray for God to remove them, the difficult times. Yet he says, take heart. We're going through this one. He says, hang on. Might be a little bumpy, but I'm going with you. And we're going right through this baby. Now watch this. Just a thought here. But straight away, Jesus said to them, what? Take heart. It is who? It is I. Have no fear. So we're in this crisis. We're in this situation where the Bible uses the term take heart. And if you'll notice, this take heart is happening. This impartation of taking heart is happening every time we're in a place of fear or crisis. So you start to learn that taking heart is part of this weaponizing, if you will, of the gospel of Jesus. Now watch it. So Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, rise, he is calling you. Here we run into this situation where Jesus is saying, take heart. Well, why can I take heart? Because Jesus says, I'm calling you. Jesus is saying, I've got your number, baby. And I'm calling you. Anybody with me? When Jesus calls us, we need to answer. And when you pick up the phone, he's going to say, take heart, I'm with you. And all of a sudden, you feel this onslaught of the power of the Spirit, this impartation, if you will, the baptism of his presence is overtaking, overwhelming. And it comes upon us. Because it's an impartation, it's a gift free from God. What sets the church of Jesus Christ, what sets us different than any other organization? It's that it is God among us, His presence, His Spirit. It shouldn't be that we occasionally encounter His presence and His Spirit. It's to be the way of life. People riding up and down that road need to look over here and say, I've never met anybody over there, but I've heard if you ever want to find God, go over there. I've heard God's in that place. That rumor will move among the lost because God will direct them to his presence. Now, keep in mind, once again, to take heart is to take control of your mind so that you can be brave and courageous and face difficult times. To take heart means to take Christ's heart. Hmm. He says, take heart. What's the rest of the story? He's saying, take mine. Say, Alan, are you sure about that? Well, let's look. He says, be straight away, Jesus said to them, take heart, it is I. Have no fear. He says, take heart, it is I. Well, what encourages you? Because you took his heart. Your own heart didn't encourage you. Your own heart's not where the power is. It's his heart. I got some terminology for this. Jesus is offering us his heart. Oh, I thought he was going to make my heart better. No, he wants to exchange it. I hope you're going a little deeper with me. What does it mean to take heart? What Jesus is saying here, 
you can take heart if you take my heart. He says, take heart, it is I. Now watch it. To have no fear is to have faith. He says, take heart and have no fear. So what is the impartation? Have no fear. Well, what causes fear to flee? It's faith. Where did it come from? From the heart of Christ, who has all faith. But it's being imparted to us. That's the reason that is no fear. Fear is a killer to faith. To have the heart of Christ is to receive his gift of his heart. Now, the reason I'm putting this terminology, you've got to understand this thing gets pretty personal. All right? Uh, I think I said it like this. When Jesus is touching our heart, he is offering us his heart. Has anybody had their heart touched by Christ? Now, here's what I want you to consider. When Christ is touching your heart, and we feel his presence, or we feel conviction, or whatever. When, when, this, when, when he touches our heart, and we're, we, we're, we just feel his presence, he's offering us his heart. How can I even feel his presence through my own heart? No, I have to have his heart to experience his presence. His presence is his heart in me. You see, we still have this battle going on. Let me consider this. To take heart is a divine exchange of one heart for another. Jesus didn't come to make you feel better about your heart. That's not why he came. He can exchange your heart for his heart. And we have these moments and times that he wants to touch us. Have you ever been overwhelmed by the presence of God and uh, be Walmart anywhere and you say, I've got to go pray for that person and you just well up in in tears or whatever. And the Lord says, "Go, go now, do it. And you're like, oh, I'm scared to death. What is that? That's his heart speaking. You all of a sudden are now operating in his heart. Let's move. Perhaps you have asked Jesus into your heart, but have you truly asked Jesus' heart to be your heart? Little question there. We've asked him into our heart, but have we asked him to replace our heart with his heart? Now, I mean, the only reason I say that don't, don't think I've mastered that plan. I was convicted by what I said. The Lord asked me that question. I'm like, well, Lord, at times. <laughs> the next thing he said, well, how far apart are the times? I'm like, I could, honestly, that's what I said, I, well, I don't know. He said, it's because you can't remember the last time. It's a good point, God. But it it got me on this quest of trying to understand what the Spirit of the Lord is trying to say about taking heart. Surface, be encouraged. Deeper, the only way you can truly be encouraged is to have His heart, and with His heart comes peace. And also something else comes with His heart. It's called the anointing. His anointing doesn't fall on your heart. I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings. His anointing, he's the anointed one. It's his heart. If you want the anointing, it has to be done on his heart. Now, what's this? The way you know you are living out of Jesus' heart is because you act different than you used to act. Simple statement, right? You're acting different than you used to act. That's just proof to you that you are living out of his heart. Uh, Being interpretive, if you're living like you always did, you might not have the heart of Christ. Just a thought. You test it. Now, 
With that in mind, I won't go a little further here. To take heart is a divine exchange of one heart for another, producing a divine purpose. So we start getting into this uh, divine purpose. You know, those words of, in that song, uh, take heart, uh, he has overcome. Is that real or is that not real? Watch this one. To take heart is a divine exchange of one heart for another, producing a divine purpose. So when I start walking in my divine purpose is when I have exchanged my heart for his heart. It says this in Matthew 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Right? I had one man came up to me and said, this is three years ago, and he said, Alan, I have but one thing I want to accomplish. And I said, what? And he said, I want to see God like Moses. I said, simple. You just need to be pure in heart. Be pure in heart, for they shall what? See God. See God. I, I'm sure I've mentioned this dream I had years ago. Um, actually, it was in a time that I had I had lung cancer at the time, and uh, in a in a dream that I had, I had this, I don't know why, but I, I was obsessed with this thing of how far away is heaven? You can say, well, Alan, that's kind of dumb. Well, it's not if you're getting ready to go, okay? <laughs> Trust it's not. And uh, I had this, I kept asking the Lord. So I had a dream in the same week, and uh, in the dream, uh, I walked into uh, to heaven. The angel of the Lord was beside me. And uh, I asked the angel, I walked into a room. It was just a room. For some reason, it had wood floors and a wood stage. And, and it was just a stage, and it had one chair. Or just a, it was a ladder back chair, a wooden chair. And uh, I was out in the congregation. The angel of the Lord was beside me, and, and I said, I said, is this the throne room? And he said, yes. I said, well, who's, whose chair is that? And he said, God's. He said, uh, that's God's throne. I said, a ladder back chair? He said, yeah. I said, where is he? He said, he's walking out in the, among the people right now. And I said, okay. Well, there was a stool or a bucket-like thing right beside me, and I couldn't see, so I stood up on it. I started looking around the congregation. I looked and I looked. Seemed like all night. I'm sure it wasn't but seconds, but seemed all night till I was so exhausted. What I remember was my legs started hurting from standing there looking. And uh, I looked over at the angel and I said, I can't find him. And uh, he said, you're not ready yet. Sending you back. So then I woke up uh, that morning and I thought, not re- I'm not ready yet. What did that mean? And uh, I'll go in, I'll not go into all of the other reasons and the few other things that happened. But I never got the interpretation of that dream. He said, I wasn't ready yet. I said, I just couldn't find God in the room. And he said, you're not ready yet. And I was preaching, this was years after that, probably eight or ten years after that. I was in a church in another state and I was standing there and I was preaching And uh, all of a sudden, about halfway through the message, I had this flashback of that dream. All I I could see was the dream. And then the whole dream played itself again. And I thought, and while I was in it, I didn't know that I was in it. And then when it was over, then I kind of came to my senses. I'm like, I'm preaching. And, but, I asked uh, the pastor after it was over, I said, did I stand there for five minutes? He said, no. He said, you paused for a second, but that was all. Well, I, there I thought I stood there kind of deaf and dumb for five minutes or something, but I didn't. It was just a split second. But here's why I stood there. That dream flashed before me. And somehow or another, I saw God in all those people, in their hearts or in something. I could see, I could see God. 
It was the oddest thing, oddest revelation. Came eight or ten years after I had the dream, standing there preaching. Bam, there's the rev. He gave me the answer to the dream eight or ten years later in a pulpit. But I haven't forgotten the interpretation. And so when I see you, I don't see you like I used to see you. I can see God in you. I can. That causes me to love everybody. Because I just say, I, I can honestly, I've been persuaded, I can see God and His people. He wouldn't want me to see Him on the stage. I'm sure He could have fulfilled that if necessary. But the point was, I could see Him and His people. Now, the down, downside of that revelation of that dream was I thought I was going to die the next week. Because now I was ready. And, uh, but I'm still here, so we'll see how long that... But, but my point is, the pure in heart will see God. I had a moment in time I was pure in heart, and I could see God and His people. That's where He was. Now, Proverbs says this, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Out of it are the... You see that? talking about heart, talking about his heart, talking about the issues of life. A pure heart equals pure life. You cannot have the wrong purpose in your heart and your life be right. You see that? So, our heart is the issue to act to, for us to swap and to take, for Christ to touch us. Now, you can't make this happen. But for Christ to touch us and give us these moments of his divine heart, it's where the anointing comes from. And I want to show you something here. And I'll be finishing up in just a moment. Our purpose in life gives meaning to our existence. Now, I'm going from taking heart and how the heart equals our purpose. And here I want you to see something. Your purpose in life gives meaning to our existence. Now, that's a, a big issue. Jeremiah 29, 11, and you know this. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, uh, plans to give uh, your hope and future. So here we see that God says he has plans for you. Does there, everybody see that? Do you believe that? God has plans for you. He has plans for me. He has plans for you. Now the question is, do you have plans for you? All right, do you have, has anybody had their plans changed by God? All right, now there's a reason. I call it another divine exchange. Our dreams are given over to his purpose. Now, Pastor Steve asked me to bring, uh, to tie this into it, which is no problem. Our dreams are given over to his purpose. Now, some of y'all have heard the next few slides, but you haven't heard the ending, all right? My dreams, his purpose. I, I went through this uh, in teaching in, in uh, the first service several weeks ago of how we all have our dreams. But then we got a purpose. You say, well, Alan, I thought I was supposed to follow my dreams. That's what we're, follow your dreams. Find out what your dreams are. And, and, and we're supposed to judge it. And, and here's what we're to do. My dreams, his purpose in the end times church. Now, does everybody remember that character? What's his name? George Bailey. Has anybody not seen It's a Wonderful Life? How protected is this congregation? <laughs> it's a Wonderful Life. That is George Bailey. I use this as an example before I'll do it again. Does anybody know who that is? That is Clarence. Clarence was who? He was an angel trying to get his wings. He was an angel, and he had to look after George Bailey. Uh, and if he did a good job in the movie, he got his wings. Uh, I think I've had an exchange of angels a couple times. <laughs> they gave up on wings. Uh, now, now, this is a, just a little picture of, you see, George Bailey always wanted to see the world. That was his dream. And in this dream, he always wanted to see the world, but he, for somehow or another, he just couldn't get out of Bedford. He, he just couldn't get out of town. 
Everybody else got out of town. His brother got out of town. And just everybody got out of town except George. But George wanted out of town more than anybody. He just couldn't get out of town. First, this would happen and that would happen. So in this, he was having a dream, I guess you could say. But he, uh, he got to see what the town would look like had he never been born. And does anybody remember that part of the dream? I mean, a movie. As though he'd never been born. So he got to look at what Bedford would look like had he not ever been born. And needless to say, it looked like hell. It was terrible. His influence upon the town changed that whole town. Now, but he was in a battle of wanting to leave town. But his life changed the town. Now, his dream was to leave town, but he changed the town. There was a conflict there of a dream and a purpose. Now, you know the end of the story, I think. Uh, you know, that's his uh, daddy's brother there. I forget his name. Uh, but he'd lost some money at the savings and loan, and then they took up money and got money. This is the last scene, and everybody's happy, and George was happy. You know, George had finally reckoned with his purpose. George discovered that his purpose was greater than his dream. Now here, I'm just going to tell you a little truth here, but you test it. There's not many people that has fully accomplished their dreams or even remotely accomplished their dreams. And the reason is you gave your heart to Christ and God's been manipulating you towards your purpose. And your problem's not with me, it's with God. God's made a promise to you to conform you to the image of his son. Now, you're not going to hear this uh, message in, you know, 20 ways to improve your life and to be successful. This, this is not that kind of message. But I am giving you definition why you haven't seen a lot of your dreams come true. Because if you will look at your purpose, you'll understand that your purpose is greater than your dream. Now, I said this little proverb one time. Uh, if you give up what appears to be greater for a lesser, you'll find out the lesser was a greater all the time. To us, it's a greater. If you give up your greater for a lesser, you'll discover that the lesser was a greater all the time. But God holds it into like of a disguise because he's, he's, he's funneling towards your purpose in life. You know, you didn't. I mean, Trevor, bless his heart, he wanted to be a rock star. <laughs> that was his dream. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's right. He wanted to be a rock star. Ed was uh, there a little bit, but not as bad as Trevor. <laughs> but he ended up being a medical doctor, which we've all heard his, his self-proclaimed testimony. He always hated being a doctor and was probably one of the best uh, doctors in the whole area. Other doctors would call him to diagnose problems. And he'd do it and did a great job. And at the end of the day, he'd call me, and I hate my job. You know. <laughs> but yet his purpose was greater than his dream. Could you imagine Trevor preaching up here as a former rock star? <laughs> Long hair and the whole bit. You got a visual, I can tell. Let's move on, <laughs> lest we lose the spirit here. The point being is, our purpose is greater than our dream. But now, it's not to say that your dream can't kind of merge with your purpose, because at times it can. It was just very difficult for God to merge rock star and doctor. That's all. That one's a little difficult. Now, let me go here. How can I know I am walking and living in the purpose God has for me? Now remember, keep in mind, take heart. You got to get that part. As we go into, uh, go into purpose, God touches us to direct us in his path of purpose for our life. And it seems along the way we get upset with everybody except ourselves. 
because the things I'm wanting to do and the dreams I'm wanting to do just aren't quite falling in place. And so we tend to kick and scream all the way. But God's so faithful to call us into purpose. Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to what? His purpose. His purpose. Okay. Now we want to claim this scripture all the time. All things work together for good. Well, they do work together for good in his purpose. Doesn't say you were dreams. Right? Matter of fact, all things will work against your dreams. Somehow or another, God works out everything to work to good because it's to, it's to fulfill his purpose. So, so we got to see that little, uh, uh, that deeper understanding there. When, <clears throat> when we are living unto uh, his purpose. Now, let's do this right quickly so I can move. I just got a few minutes here. Romans 8, 28. We got my dreams, his purpose. My dreams usually serve self. His purpose usually serves others. Uh, you can tweak them a little bit, add different things. My dreams usually is selfish ambition. His pur- uh, purpose is usually ambition. Uh, that's that's just, uh, just a little guideline we can use in trying to discover what we're doing. If we live our lives in purpose, we shall never fail. Now, <clears throat> his dream became his purpose, and I think everybody knows who that is, Martin Luther King. He had a dream, but if you read his, a lot of his biography and different, do you know what Martin Luther King Jr. wanted to do? He just wanted to preach. That is all he wanted to do. His father was the civil rights guy. He was the son. All he wanted to do was preach. So God called him into that other movement. He must have made a deal with God because he said, okay, I'll go, but I'm preaching. Right? Some of his greatest sermons was out of that movement. I don't know if you listened to any of them or not. And I know a lot of people are against the movement and all this, that, and the other. The only thing I can say is you need to take it up with God because God fulfilled his purpose uh, through that man. But there you can see he mixed his dreams with his purpose. And you can see he had a famous speech that he said, you know, I have a dream. You remember that? That was so prophetic in, in what I'm saying here, how, how he took his dream. He fought, sooner or later, he had to surrender it to God's purpose. And he said, yes. I think he knew, and he mentioned it several times, if, if he does this, he'll probably be killed. You know, he knew that. But yet, he let his dream go into God's purpose. And God fulfilled a purpose in that man's life. Now, the ch- now, now that's an individual thing. And I got just a few minutes. If we, will y'all give me, f- can I go five minutes over, Pastor? Or? I didn't get but one yes, but I'm going to do it here because yours counts. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right, that was an, ind- we got individual purposes, but then we got the purpose of the church. Take heart. The purpose of the church. Now let's watch this. Um, Karen, I hate to interrupt y'all, but y'all can come up if you'd like. <clears throat> We're going to jump into that song pretty quickly. <clears throat> Here's the church and its purpose. <clears throat> I call it another divine exchange from one kingdom to another. Divine exchange. The church and its purpose. The church and its purpose. You got the church. But here we're talking about, key back in with me. Don't look at everybody walking. Key back in with me. The church has a purpose. We got individual purposes, but the church collectively has a purpose. I want you to hear this. What was Jesus' main purpose while on the earth? Matthew 6, 9 through 10. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, what? You know the story. Which is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then what does it say? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth. It's what? Now I want you to look at that prayer. What was Jesus' main purpose while on this earth? Thy kingdom come, and then thy will be done. 
Where? In earth as it is in heaven. So there you see, Jesus had two main purposes in coming to this earth. And it was that God's kingdom would come and that his will could be done on earth as it is in heaven. The purpose on why we're here is thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's why we're here today. Take heart. God has a purpose with his church and with you. All right, watch this one. What was Jesus' message when talking about his purpose? Now, there again, now just look at my wording there. What was Jesus' message when talking about his purpose? All right, Jesus said, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come. Okay, that was his purpose. Now, Jesus had a message in which to deliver the purpose. Are you with me? Now, listen, everything's in the message. Do you know that? The details are in the message. The message is just not a message. The message is a message. Watch this. Matthew 3, what was the message? In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying what? Repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is what? So Jesus said, pray like this. Just pray that God's kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. He said, pray like this. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus said, pray like this. And then Jesus had a message. It says, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at, at hand. So Jesus continually talks about the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. The deal about Jesus coming was it was Jesus was a king and he had a kingdom. Jesus didn't say, repent ye, for I have come to forgive the sins of the world there. He says, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is hand. The issue is not forgiveness of sins. The issue is the kingdom of heaven's at hand. That was the gospel. Now, there's a lot of good news of the gospel. But the gospel was the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, watch this. Keep in mind the purpose of the church. Mark 1 says this. Now, after that John was in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching what? The gospel of the kingdom of God. There again, it's about the kingdom. Jesus preached something that's about the kingdom of God. He said the kingdom of God's at hand. That's the message. And saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Well, repent of what? Not believing that the kingdom's at hand. When you came into, in here today, were you looking for the kingdom of God to show up here? If not, you need to repent. Because the kingdom of God's at hand. That's the message. That is the gospel of today. Now watch it. Jesus' message and purpose when talking to the 12 disciples. And Jesus went all about, about all Galilee, teaching their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Now, when he preached the gospel of the kingdom, it just so happened that you had healing of all manner of sicknesses and all manner of diseases. But he wasn't calling for healing service. He was saying, the kingdom is at hand. That's the message. That's the message. Watch this. And as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is what he told the 12. What did he tell them to preach? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leopard, raise the dead, cast out the devil freely, you receive freely, give. But what they were preaching was the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I have a purpose in what I'm saying. This is my last slide. You maybe remember this slide from the beginning of this teaching. But straight away, Jesus said to them, take heart. It is I have no fear. 
Now watch this one. Jesus stopped and said, call him. For they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, rise. He is calling you. All right. I bring you this message this morning to take heart. But there's some of you sitting in this room and watching online. I'm here to declare the kingdom of heaven's at hand. I don't have to wait on a fuzzy feeling. Jesus told me to proclaim the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So I'm here before you today declaring the kingdom of heaven's at hand. Now, I fulfilled my part. Your part is, is he calling you for healing? Is he calling you for salvation? Is he calling you in your crisis? In this message today, the question is, for you, I'm saying the kingdom of heaven's at hand. If you feel he's calling you, then you need to respond today. I've done my part. I've been true to the word of God. I've delivered it as instructed. And it's by special invitation I'm here today to bring you this message. I advise you to take it seriously. Now, if there's anything, uh, Karen, just give me a little little music here. As Jackie Gleason said, give me a little traveling music. If you feel Jesus saying, take heart, rise he is calling you in any crisis or sickness now our we're going to have prayer pods altars going to be open we got baptism but I'm going to ask you if you feel that God's telling you to take heart if he's calling you right now for prayer you can just stand where you are and I'm going to pray for you and that's all we're going to do unless you want more I want you to stand The Lord says, take heart. He's the one that calls. My job was to tell you his kingdom's at hand. It's here. Your job is to respond because he's calling you to that message. So I pray over you right now In the name of Jesus, Lord Jesus, you see every heart. You see those that are responding to your call. You say when you call, you say you're there. We're believing your message that the kingdom of heaven is here and is among us. I ask and pray, O oh God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, that this church would fulfill its purpose on why you put us here to declare thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, declared by this congregation. Let it be said, let it be known that we believe your kingdom is here and we receive it you say it's at hand lord put your hand upon every shoulder right now that's standing here put your hand on every shoulder oh god how can you touch us oh god and us not receive something from you i pray for physical healing for mental healing i pray oh god that there'd be no fear in this place because your hand is touching your people. We knew our faith, O oh God, in your word. 
in part to everyone that's here, oh God, and those that are watching online. In part, oh God, the biblical term to take heart, which is your heart, to come upon us, to be real in us, that we might have the anointed heart of Christ, that the lost might be saved, the sick healed, the demoniac delivered. So Lord Jesus, I have been true to what you spoke to me. Lord, the rest is up to you. So I bless these people and I ask you to bless them in mental and physical and spiritual health this day. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.